Hey everyone, you're watching Bridge Sports Brothers Slides. In today's video, as you may have guessed, we're installing FPP version 5 onto a Raspberry Pi. Version 5 is a brand new version that came out just weeks ago and they have completely remade the software so everything is different and the main update that they did was make the buttons bigger so it's more mobile friendly for version 5. But before we get started with the video, would you be so kind and push the subscribe button? On this channel I talk about a bunch of different things with special Christmas lights called RGB pixels and I give you behind the scenes tour of my show and give you tips and tricks on how to set up your show and at the end of the year I show you my Halloween and Christmas light show so hit the subscribe button down below and also turn on post notifications and set them to all so you get notified every time I upload a new video and one other thing I'd like to thank Tom you'll see his comment on the screen somewhere he pointed out on my differential receivers videos that the ethernet ports on the differential receivers are not actually ethernet ports you can't connect any ethernet cables up to them they're just RJ45 jacks so don't connect any ethernet um, uh, stuff to them don't connect them to your router or anything because you will damage them they're not ethernet ports so thank you Tom for pointing that out so now back to today's video so FPP is a set of files that you put on an SD card and put into a Raspberry Pi's SD card slot right here and it turns the Raspberry Pi into what you could call the brains of the system for your light show it processes all the data and tells a controller like this one up here what to do uh, and when to send out the lights, um, uh, data, what ports to send them out. So you upload all of your sequences, your media and everything, and then it outputs audio to your transmitter if you have any, video if you have any, if you want to, and then it sends out the main data for the lights out the ethernet port. So like I said, this is the main brain of the system and you can have multiple FPPs with one of them controlling all of them. So uh, you can find FPP on a, a website called GitHub and I'll show you that in a minute for the software and uh, then you uh, format the SD card, you flash the software to the SD card and then put it on the Pi and then that's how you get this Pi to work and there are some settings and it can get complicated at times but I'll try and go over everything as best as I can. So for the supplies needed you're obviously going to need a Raspberry Pi um, uh, mine is the Raspberry Pi version 4 um, uh, it has one gigabyte of RAM you can install FPP on a Pi 3, 4, 0 and there's a bunch of other versions that you can install it on. I'll show them all on the screen so I don't miss any. And then you can also install them on BeagleBone computers, which are kind of like a Raspberry Pi, but a different type and they can do different things. And any RAM size, if you have the Pi 4, will be fine. Um, one gigabyte will be fine. Two, you can have that if you want. Four will be overkill. And then you might want a Raspberry Pi case to um, uh, keep the Raspberry Pi safe so you don't drop it or anything. This one just snaps on. This is a cheap version of the case, but it still works great. You're going to need a Ethernet cable. You are going to need the Raspberry Pi uh, power supply. For the Raspberry Pi 4, you need at least 3 amps of power. And this actually delivers 3.5 amps. So this is enough for the Pi. If you underpower the Pi, there might be some problems and it might not work correctly. So make sure you have enough power. And then you're going to need an SD card. This is a on SD card, 32 gigabytes. Um, uh, any gig, any SD card from 4 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes will be great. The um, file size is about 4.4 gigabytes the last time I checked, so you might need an 8 gigabyte SD card at least. And I don't recommend going over 32 gigabytes because then you need to do a bunch of special stuff to format it on a Windows computer. And then you are also going to need a connection to your router. Um, uh, I have an Ethernet port right here that goes out to my router and there's a port that comes up here into a network switch. If you don't have access to your router or you can't plug in your Raspberry Pi to your router, I will have a video and I'll show in just a few minutes how to use other ways to connect to it. And then you're obviously going to need a computer. So that's all the supplies you need. So now let's get started. First, you need to get the software for the Pi. To do that, go to https colon slash slash github.com slash falcon christmas slash fpp. The link is in the description. Then go to releases and then click the release you need. For software for any version of a Pi, click on FPP-V5.0 or the version available in the future, dash pi.image.zip. For any BeagleBone versions, click on the BBB image. 
Once you click it, it will download a zip file. To get the software onto the SD card, you will need a way to flash and format the SD card. For formatting software, you can use any software of your choice or built-in software on your computer. For flashing, I recommend you go to https colon slash slash www.balena.io slash etcher and download and install that. Once you have installed that, go ahead and format the SD card. I'll be formatting my SD card with software called SD Card Formatter. Once again, you use anything you like. When formatting the SD card, make sure the file system is set to FAT32 or your Raspberry Pi won't be able to read the software. Formatting should take less than 30 seconds. Once it's finished formatting, close the SD card formatter and open Etcher. When it opens, select Flash from File, then select the FPP v5 zip file we just downloaded. Now select the SD card when selecting target. Finally click flash and let it do its thing. I recommend plugging in your computer if you walk away since it could take up to 10 minutes or even more to flash for slower computers. When it finishes, you can take out your SD card and close Etcher. Before continuing on with putting the software onto the Pi, it is possible to back up your old settings from FPP v2, v3, or v4 and put them on v5. Continue watching if you want to back up your settings to FPP v5 or skip to the time shown to continue putting the software onto the Pi. First, log on to your FPP, then go to FPP Backup under the Status Control tab. It's recommended to back up your settings with JSON Configuration Backup, but you can use File Copy Backup if you want. Under JSON Backup, select the backup area you would like to save. You can select all for everything or just certain things of FPP you want to save. If you want, you can check out Protect Sensitive Data. Once you've selected what to back up, you can push Download Configuration. The SD card has finished formatting and I have that right here now. So first I'm going to pop the Raspberry Pi into this case so um, it doesn't get damaged or anything. Make sure the holes line up. There we go. It's in. I can just snap on the cover like that and I can put in the SD card right there. And now, like I said, I have the, um, uh, I'm going to have the Pi hardwired into my router. That way I can access it easier. So let me untie this Ethernet cable. But um, right here I have this network switch and this yellow Ethernet cable right here goes into our router. So I'm going to plug this into the Pi's Ethernet port like that. And I'll just plug this into the network switch like that. The Pi is all hooked up. The SD card is in. So now it should be okay to apply power. And if, like I said, um, uh, you don't have a way to connect to your router, to hardwire it to your router, Go check out the um, other little video that I showed a few minutes ago with uh, using the Raspberry Pi's hotspot. But now I'm going to plug in the power supply, which has more than enough power for the Pi 4. I'll plug that in there and plug it in to the Pi. Lights come on. And then the Ethernet lights should turn on in a second. There we go. So now let's head back over to my computer so I can show you... The setup now. It's been a couple of minutes, so the Pi should be completely booted. The next step is to find the IP address of your Pi. This can be one of the hardest steps since everyone's routers vary on how they work. If you did not hardwire your Pi into your router and you watched the other ways to connect to it, you could skip to the time shown on the screen. The first step is to log on to your router. To do this, open a web browser and type in the IP address of your router. If you don't know it, it's more than likely 192.168.0.1 or 192.168.1.1. Make sure you're connected to the same network as the Pi when doing this. When you get to your router, it will ask you to enter a password and possibly a username. If you're unsure what yours is, try admin for username and admin or password for password. Like said, this step will look very different for others. Once logged in, look for a menu that says devices or device list and click that. Once you click that, it will show all the different devices connected to your home router. Scroll through the list and look for one that says FPP or Raspberry. I've had it say unknown device before. When you find your IP address, click it. It will give you a bunch of uh, info like model, manufacturer, OS, IP address, and MAC address. Sometimes I've had it say my Raspberry Pi OS is Windows 7 for some reason. 
What you're looking for is the IP address. Once you find it, type that into your browser. If everything worked correctly, you should see the FPP setup wizard. When you see the setup wizard or FPP initial setup, it will ask you to set up a few things. For those of you who had a light show before and are used to FPP v3 or 4, this will look very different. In fact, this is the biggest change from one version to the next in FPP history. Not so much for just the features, but also the look and feel. The first thing it will ask you to set up is the FPP player mode. In versions before v5, four modes were available. Player, or standalone as some called it, master, remote, and bridge. Now there's only two, player and remote. The way the modes work is player is set if you only have one pie or have multiple pies, with this one controlling them all. Remote is enabled if you have one, if this is one of multiple pies with a different one controlling them all. For an example, you can have one pie set to player, running some lights and audio, and then one remote pie running a projector, and another remote pie running lights across the road. So for those used to versions 3 or 4, master and player mode have been joined together to make just player mode, and remote has stayed the same. Bridge mode has been moved from this list and must be enabled under channel inputs. For today, I will set the mode to player. Next the host name. This is to give it a unique name to the pie. You can leave it to FPP if you have one pie, but should change it if you have two or more. For example, this could be called main FPP, then another one could be called remote FPP. Host description is to just give your pie a description. Then you have share statistics. This allows the FPP team to receive info about your pie to help make the software better. It will give them info like if there is an error, then they can figure out what happened. The FPP team will not take any personal info such as Wi-Fi passwords. Banner means it will be set to off, but keep asking you if you would like to change it. Enable will enable it, and disable will disable it. Fetch cape logos from vendors and send cape serial numbers to vendors will allow a cape or pie hat to send and receive data from a vendor, such as telling the vendor what your cape or hat is doing to help make the future versions better, or for the hat or cape to get a logo so it can display it on Buddha. None of these matter to me since I don't use hats or capes, so I'll just leave them checked. Location is to tell your country. This way, you can get proper holidays to show up in the schedule. I'm in the United States, so that's what I'll set it to. Next is to set the time zone, so FPP can grab the right time. I'm in the US Eastern, so that's what I'll set it to. The final setting is to set your latitude and longitude, so FPP can get the correct timing for sunset and sunrise times. You can find these values by clicking look up location, and it will auto fill them in. Now just click finish setup. When you're done, FPP will ask you to restart. Go ahead and do that. The next step is to expand the file system. When you go to the status page of FPP, it will ask you to go to storage settings to expand the file system. So click the link it shows. Once you get there, push the button that says grow file system. When you do this, FPP will need a reboot and this can take a few minutes. Once it takes you to the status page, it's finished. The next thing I like to do is to go through all the settings under the status control tab and change the settings to what I like. I'll go over all of them except the network settings and I'll come back to that. First is obviously the status page. Here you can view what sequences and playlists are playing, start or stop them, change the volume, and view some other basic data about the Pi. I found that setting the volume to 79 gives the highest volume without clipping, so I'll change that. One of the main things that the FPP team tried to change with the, the, uh, with the V5 update is to make all the buttons bigger, so it's mobile friendly. So you notice the sizes of most buttons have gotten much bigger. The next tab is the multi-sync tab. This is where you connect all of your remote pies, if you have any, to run with this pie or a different pie in player mode. Right now, only this pie shows up since it's the only one on. The next tab is FPP settings. This has some basic settings for the Pi when running FPP. I won't go over all of them, but you can see which each one does by hovering over the question mark. I like to ch check blanks between sequences. That way, if a sequence ends with the lights on, FPP will shut them off for the next sequence. When changing settings, FPP will ask for a restart or a reboot, but you won't have to do it until you're done changing all the settings here. Audio video has some settings if you were using a projector for example, 
or want to switch what audio output you will use if you had a sound blaster. Time was already set during the setup wizard. The UI settings gives you the ability to add a password, change the colors of the UI, and change the UI interface. I like to change my user interface level to advanced so I get more advanced settings when using FPP. I also use Fahrenheit for temperature. Then, next setting is for adding emails, so you can get emailed for certain events such as the Pi started a playlist. MQTT is for sending and receiving special messages to a broker to control the Pi when away from home. The privacy tab is to select what the FPP developers can see from your Pi. If you want to know exactly what data they receive, you can push the preview statistics button to find out. Input output is to see and change info about the Pi is inputting and outputting. Logging is to set how much info you get notified about when certain things in FPP happen. Storage is to set where your data is being stored on the Pi. System is to set all the settings for the main system. Developer has settings for changing things about the FPP build and version. I don't recommend changing any of these. Once you have all the settings set for you, you can restart or reboot FPP. FPP backup is where you can restore or backup your configuration. If you backed up your config in the old version of FPP, you can restore it here in V5. To restore your config, click on choose file and select the file you downloaded from your old FPP. You can then select what to restore and whether or not to keep your network and or master remote settings. Once you've selected your file or files, click restore config. When finished changing all the settings, you'll need to restart or possibly reboot FPP. The next tab is the proxy settings. This is used to access an EU1.31 controller's config page through proxies so you don't have to set up complex routing tables. After that, the next tab is the command presets page. This is, page is used to set up different commands such as start this effect or increase volume and be able to trigger each one manually. Then the effects tab is where you can display certain effects on certain models. An example could be a butterfly effect on Christmas Eve after the show across the whole house. Finally, the last tab on the status control section is the display testing. This is used to test any model or channels with different colors. This is somewhat like a controller's test mode, but more advanced. You can select different patterns with different speeds or make your own solid color with RGB colors. If you use testing while your sequence is running, the test will override the sequence. You can also use sequence testing, which will allow you to start or stop a sequence, or start a sequence at any point in the middle of it. Sequence testing does not test audio or video and will not work if any playlist is playing. Wow, so we've covered a lot of stuff so far. We now have just about the whole status control tab set up. The last section in the status control tab is the network setup. This can be a very hard step and um, is very confusing. It, you, there is a lot of steps you can mess up, but basically what we're going to be doing is uh, setting up the Pi so we can connect to your router without the Ethernet cable, so you can get rid of the Ethernet cable and use Wi-Fi through your router. Um, uh, if you, like I said earlier, do not have access to your home router and you need uh, to do a different way, you can't plug your Pi into your router for whatever reason, check out this video right up here. Um, uh, it's going to it's a unlisted video. It's just going to quickly show you how to set up the Pi with its own Wi-Fi hotspot. So go ahead and check that out. But now let's move on to the network setup. If you have any questions at all or are confused, feel free to leave a comment, and I'll do my best to explain. So let's go do that now. So back on the Pi, go to the status control and network. So for today in this video, I'm just going to show you how to set up the network so you can easily access the Pi through Wi-Fi and get rid of the Ethernet cable. Then in the future, I'll make a video for adding in a controller to the network setup and a remote Pi. The first step is to make sure the Wi-Fi drivers are set to external and the Wi-Fi regulatory domain is set to your country. Mine will be the US. Then under interface name, click on WLAN0. WLAN0 stands for the Wi-Fi connection and ETH0 stands for Ethernet connection. Now for the interface mode. DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which is basically means is when you connect your phone or computer or smart TV or iPad or even your smart vacuum cleaner to your Wi-Fi, your router will automatically give it an IP address. You need to know the exact IP address 
to be able to type it into your browser when you want to access FPP. The only problem is, if you use DHCP, it can change when you move the device around the house. If the IP address changes, you need to go back onto your router to find it to type into the browser. But then there's static. If you use static, you can't just type in your router's name and password to connect to it. You also have to give your device an IP address. You have to be careful with which one you pick, but once it's picked, 99% of the time it won't change. So I will be showing you how to connect your Pi with static since it's more reliable. But if you don't mind the IP address changing, all you need to do is put in your router's SSID and password and you're good. But for static, first put in the SSID of your network or the name of your Wi-Fi, then your Wi-Fi password. When you click the box to enter your SSID, a list of all the Wi-Fi names in the Pi's range should show up and uh, you should be able to pick one. Then, check the box above to static. Next, for the gateway, put in the IP address of your router. Mine is 192.168.1.1. For the net mask, put in 255.255.255.0. Then finally, you have to pick your IP address. The first two sets of numbers in most cases will be 192.168. The third number will be the same as your router's third number, so 1 in my case. And then the last seven numbers can be anywhere between 2 and 254, but do not pick a number another device on your network is using. A way to find open IP addresses is to log on to your router. This part will be different for everyone since everyone has different routers. But in my case, I go under troubleshooting and it shows me all the devices and their IP addresses. So looking at my chart, I could see that 104 is not being used. So my whole IP address for the Pi would be 192.168.1.104. When you're done, push update interface, then restart network. Remember your IP address you entered, you will need it for later. We are almost done. One last step. Go to host and DNS settings where it says DNS server 1, type in 8.8.8.8 .8 and where it says DNS server 2, type in 8.8.4.4. Then push update DNS. Finally, it will ask you to reboot the Pi. Push reboot. When it's done rebooting, if you see a little Wi-Fi sign next to the ETH0 sign, try entering the IP address you set the Pi to in your browser. It should be different than the Ethernet one. If it worked, you are all set to unplug the Ethernet cable. You more than likely finished the hardest step of all. Now, we are going to talk about the content setup section. This is where we will upload your sequences and audio, make a playlist, and schedule it for when to start. First. Go to your file manager. This is where all your sequences, videos, audio, images, effects, scripts, and logs will be held. Most of you, you only need sequences and audio, and possibly video and pictures. If you haven't made a sequence yet, or don't know how to, check out this full tutorial about X-Lights linked up here. There are two ways you can upload the sequences and audio to the Pi. The first way is clicking select files, then selecting which sequences and audio files to upload from your XLights folder. You can use this way if you want, but there's a second way I personally think is more efficient. First, open XLights on your computer, then go to Tools and FPP Connect. When this window opens, it will show you all the available FPP instances it detects on your network. Select the one you want to upload the files to. Then select whether or not to upload media and or, and or models. I will check off both. Next, select all the sequences you want to upload to it. Finally, push upload. It may take a few minutes to upload, especially if you have long video clips in your sequences like I do. When it's finished, refresh the tab with the file manager in it on FPP, and you should see all of your sequences and audio. Now to play the sequences, we're going to make a playlist. Go to Content Setup Playlists. For those of you used to FPP v4, you will notice that the playlist tab has changed a lot. The first step to make a new playlist is click New Playlist and then give it a name, optional description, and choose whether or not to randomize. Randomize will basically play the sequences in a random order. Then click Add Playlist. At the top, you have some different buttons. The first one will take you back to the list of playlists. The gear button will let you change some settings to the playlist. Playlist options will allow you to rename, delete, or do other things with the playlist. And Save Playlist will obviously save the playlist. To add a sequence, command, script, or other, push add sequence slash entry. The settings you have are to select the type, select the sequence, select the media, the video out, and add a note. 
Once selecting what you want to enter, push add or insert. Continue doing this for all the sequences you want to add. You can use the icons to the left of the playlist to adjust their order. If you scroll over the entry, you can edit or delete it. Once finished editing the playlist, click save at the top. So we have a playlist, now let's give it a schedule to run on. Go to Content Setup Scheduler. First, click Add. Then you can select the start and end date. I will set it up as I would for my show. Next, select the day or days to play on. I will select Day Mask so I can choose which days to play. After that, I'll set the start time to 5 p.m. You can select any exact hour or exact hour within 30 minutes, then add minutes. Or you can select Dawn, Sunrise, Sunset, or Dusk. You must have your location set up for these to work properly. Now, set the schedule type and playlist. The schedule type is new because you used to only be able to schedule playlists, but now you can schedule sequences and commands too. Finally, I'll set the end time, repeat mode, and stop type. I'll set the end time to 10 p.m. and the repeat mode to immediate. The repeat mode is basically where you can select for the place to wait a certain amount of minutes until it repeats or not. I'll set the stop type to graceful. This is how the scheduler stops the playlist at the end time. Hard stop means it will immediately stop in the middle of a song. Graceful means it will finish the song currently playing, then stop. And graceful loop means it will finish the entire playlist, then stop. When you're done, click save. If you click the schedule, you can delete or clone it. We are past halfway there. We now have all the basic settings set up on the Pi. The network is now set up so you can access it over um, uh, the Wi-Fi. Hopefully you were able to get that set up okay. And um, uh, so now you can play the playlist. No data will be sent out of the Pi's Ethernet port yet because the channel output is not set up. But you can hear audio though out of the Pi if you have that set up. So um, you can test it if you want to make sure that your playlist works but you won't get any channel data out yet. So first I'm going to talk about the last two tabs in the content setup page and then we are going to move on to the channel input outputs tab. The fourth tab is the script repository browser. Under this tab, you can view and install different scripts to make your Pi do different things. Two I like to install are the shutdown.sh and shutdownremotes.sh. I insert these at the very end of the last sequence for the night. That way the Pi's can have a smooth shutdown and not all of a sudden have power disconnected from them from an outlet timer. You can install any scripts you want as long as the SD card has space, which it more than likely will have. The last tab is the plugins tab. This is where you can install different features for the Pi to have uh, such as a board of buttons to easily control from your phone to do different things. There are some really cool plugins here like the video capture one. This can take video from a camera that can be attached to the Pi and turn it into channel data and display it on a matrix or mega tree. I highly recommend you check some of these out. The next section we are going to look at is the input output setup. Channel inputs tab is where you can set the Pi to receive data from another Pi to run lights directly on it. To use this, first check enable output, then enter the number of input counts and push set. Next, give it an input type, FPP channel start, universe number, universe count, and universe size. Make sure the values match the values on your input device. This tab does not need any setup if you are going to use a controller that receives data from the Pi. When finished, push save. You will need to restart FPP. The next section is the channel outputs. This is the main tab you have to set up for a controller to receive data. First, make sure your output is enabled. Second, set the source interface to ETH0. This means that the data will be sent out over Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi. I do not recommend setting this to WLAN0 at all since most controllers need a hardwired connection and there's just way too much data to use over Wi-Fi. Third, set the output counts. I will set mine to 1. Fourth, give the output a optional description. Set the output type. Most of the time this will be E1.31 multicast or unicast. Set the start channel, universe number, universe count, and universe size. All of this should be set up basing it on how your controller is set up in X lights. For my layout, the start channel is 1, the universe number is 1, the universe count is 24, universe size is 512, and I'll leave the universe priority to 0. Again, if you're not sure how to set it up, copy all the settings from how your controller is set up in X-Lite. Once you're finished, push save. You will need to restart FPP. The next section under channel outputs is pixel strings. 
This is where you would set up pixels directly on the pie with a special hat or a cake. After that is LED panels. There are tons of uh, settings on this section that are used to set up LED panels to run off your pie. I have no idea how to set up any of this, so I'll skip ahead. The last section on here is other. This is where you would set up other outputs such as AC lights, a relay, or a projector. If you don't know how to set up your device on here, try to search for it online and more than likely there's info about it. Moving on from channel outputs to output processors, this is where you'd set up how the lights run on the controller. Most of the time you do these settings on your controller, but you could set it here if you want. Here you could set brightness for certain lights, color order, or even remap channels to other channels. This can be helpful if you messed up a config in X lights and don't want to have to fix it in there. Then re-render and upload your sequences. The next tab is pixel overlay models. Here you could set up what models go on what channel. This is optional to set up, but can be helpful for debugging and testing only certain models. Mine is already set up since I selected to upload models on FPP Connect back in X lights. You could set it up manually. Finally, you have GPIO inputs. Here you could set up a command if a GPI input pins value is falling or rising. For example, you could put a button on your Pi to turn up the volume when it's pushed, or put a motion sensor in a donation box so when someone donates something, a special sequence plays. The final tab on FPP is the help tab. Under it, you have info for stuff about the Pi, plus a bunch of resources to forums or to the FPP manual, which was actually just updated on August 7th. The About tab gives you info on the version, CPU usage, uptime, player stats, manual, and FPP forms. Then a Help Index. This gives you resources if you have a problem with a certain feature in FPP. Following that, you have the REST API Help. This gives you commands for different things in FPP to test. Then the FPP and FPPMM usage receives information to different things in FPP. Now you have the Credits tab. I don't need to explain anything about this tab obviously, but I do recommend you read the names of the people here because without them, I honestly probably wouldn't have a light show. If this software didn't exist, I'm not sure how I'd control my show, and I'm sure most of you would have the same problem. So shout out to all the FPP developers, creators, and contributors. Thank you for making this software. Finally at the bottom, you have a system health check troubleshooting commands, and the SSH shell, which is used for debugging and running special commands in FPP. So that is it. That is the entire setup for FPP. Hopefully you got everything working. You can now test your playlists, and hopefully the data will come out of the Ethernet port to your controller if you have one, so you can test that. All the audio should work. If you have had any problems at all or anything did not make sense, please feel free to leave a comment and I'll answer it as soon as possible to help you figure out whatever is going on. And I tried to explain it the best I can. Hopefully this wasn't a really long video. But yeah, if you have any questions, just leave them down below. Now, score your order did arrive, so that is gonna be the uh, next video probably. And I'm not gonna show everything that was in it, but this is the star that was in it, and it's literally half my height. So this is gonna be pretty hard to attach to the tree. So I'm gonna figure that out. And there's a lot of other cool stuff that came in that order, so stay tuned for that. And I will be working on the How to Use a Projector Part 2 um, uh, for all the different things that you can run on a projector, like how to, um, uh, what videos you can put on it, or how to program it more, de more with more details in uh, x -Lite. And obviously Halloween is uh, coming very soon, it's only like two months away already. So um, there are going to be a lot of build videos and... Uh, um, uh, we are working on trying to get the lights onto the roof that if you saw the teasers, there's going to be lights on the roof. That's more difficult than we thought, so I'm going to have a video about that. And hopefully I'm going to have a video about a new project that we are that um, uh, I have in the garage. Last year we popped the breaker one time for the lights because the lights are on um, the same breaker as a kitchen and as a, a bedroom. And it's a 20 amp breaker, so that was with only about 500 lights, and that popped the breaker. So this year, with 4,000 lights, uh, we had to do something with the wiring. So I'll show you all that, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe. And hit the little bell down below. Set it to all, so that way you get notified every time I upload a new video. You will get a notification, and that way you can be the first to come to my video. So thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.